Merrimack TV is committed to our community. From gavel to gavel coverage of town and school board meetings to updates on town services and projects, we aim to keep you connected. Uh, good morning, I'm Kyle Fox, Public Works Director for the Town of Merrimack. Hi, I'm Diane Trippett. I'm the Town Clerk Tax Collector for the Town of Merrimack. I'm Captain Matt Tarleton with the Merrimack New Hampshire Police Department. And keep the public informed of every motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And many moments, so you can be confident that we're here for you. Thanks for watching. Stay connected. Follow Merrimack TV on Facebook. are all set thank you thank you justin uh good evening ladies and gentlemen let me call to order the merrimack planning board meeting for tuesday march 16th 2021 at 7 16 p.m um, glad we're able to get a quorum and and get some work done here tonight uh before proceeding let me go on to our usual COVID 19 remote meeting script as chair of the Merrimack Planning Board, due to the COVID-19 crisis in accordance with Governor Cindy News Emergency Order Number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-4, this board's authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to the meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the Governor's Emergency Order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, this is to confirm that we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possibilities by video or other electronic means. We are utilizing the Zoom platform for this electronic meeting. All members of the board have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during the meeting through the Zoom platform, and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in the meeting through dialing either of the following phone numbers, 1312-626-6799 or 1929-205-6099 and meeting ID, entering meeting ID 926-3461-2105. The meeting may also be viewed on Merrimack TV uh, channel 20 on Comcast and on Merrimack TV's webpage at www.merrimacktv.com. When public comment is opened, uh, we will ask those who wish to address the board to press star nine on the phone to raise your hand in order to be recognized. Star nine to be recognized. Once you're called upon, you press star six to unmute your audio and present your testimony. We're providing public notice of the uh, necessary information for accessing the meeting. We previously gave notice to the public of how to access the meeting using Zoom and instructions are provided in the meeting agenda posted on the town of Merrimack's website at www.merrimacknh.gov forward slash planning dash board. We're providing a mechanism for the public to alert this public body during the meeting if there are problems with access. If anybody has a problem with access, please email cwolf, C-W-O-L-F-E, at merrimacknh.gov. We would adjourn the meeting uh, if the public is unable to access it. In the event the public is unable to access the meeting, we'd adjourn it and reschedule it at that time. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member uh, states their presence, please also state whether there's anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. With that in mind, uh, Alistair Mills. I am present, Mr. Chairman, and there's nobody in the room with me. Nelson Disco. I'm uh, alone in my home and I'm present for this meeting. Councillor Bill Boyd. Uh, good evening, this is uh, Town Council Bill Boyd. I'm currently alone in my office. However, my wife and my daughter are in other parts of the house. I am prepared for tonight's meeting and am able to listen to the conversation that is going on. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Boyd. Uh, I am Bob Best. I'm present uh, in my home. There's nobody in the room with me, although there's various kids and wife and dogs and a cat in the house who may appear behind me in this space right here. Um, with that in mind, let me appoint Nelson Disco to a voting position. We'll put you in for Lynn's position today uh, so that we have four people and a quorum. With that in mind, 
let's see where we're at with this. Our next planning board meeting after tonight is currently scheduled for April 2021. And yeah, that'll be conducted remotely by Zoom. Um, let's see, we went over the star sixes and star nines. So we're all set with that. Uh, please make sure when you speak, uh, whether you're the applicant or whether you're a member of the public that you clearly identify yourself for the record with both your name and address um, so that we can catch that for the minutes. Um, that completes the call to order for our meeting. And the next item on our agenda, item two, is our planning and zoning administrator's report. Casey, you have anything for us? Sorry, I forgot to mute myself. Uh, there, there's nothing to report tonight. Does any member of the board have any questions for staff? Bill? Is it still status quo with uh, the Flatley project? Uh, they are, they resubmitted a, I'm sorry, uh, today we had an application deadline uh, for planning board and today they did submit an amendment to their CUP. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions by members of the board for staff? Okay, uh, before we move on to item number three on our agenda, I just wanted to announce to anybody who is interested in it, um, it's my intention to change the order of our agenda. Um, item five, which is SJ Torres, um, it seems to be a um, fairly brief discussion and I'll put that ahead of the discussion on RCL Realty. So I'll switch four and five on the agenda when we get to them, uh, just to hopefully have some anybody that's interested in number five not have to wait through what might be a lengthy discussion on number four. With that in mind, let's do number three. Kodiak Veterinary Hospital LLC as the applicant and Karen Roy as the owner. This is continued review for consideration of final approval for a 2,224 square foot building addition and change of use to a veterinary clinic. The parcel is located at 255 Daniel Webster Highway in the I-1 Industrial and Aquifer Conservation Districts, tax map 3D2, lot 39, case planning board 2021-6. It's continued from our February 16th, 2021 planning board meeting. Casey, is there anything that we need to know before we hear from the applicant? Uh, no, not in particular. Just a reminder that this was on your agenda previously in February. Uh, you continued it uh, that day because we had not yet received comments from Fuss and O'Neill, which have since been boarded to the applicant. At that February meeting, uh, the board did accept the application as complete. Okay. Are there any waivers requested or were there any then? Uh, there yes, were there waivers requested. Um, they were not entertained by the board at that meeting, so they still okay. need to be addressed. Thank you for that. Okay, Matt, you're up with this one? I am. All right, good evening. Uh, Matt Peterson with Keach Nordstrom Associates here, uh, representing Kodiak Vet Clinic here. Again, as Casey had just stated, we were here uh, about a month ago, and the only reason we kind of moved it forward, I assume you can see my screen at this point? And Yes, um, we're talking about the existing um, real estate office, basically, that sat in this location here today. And um, there were a couple comments from staff uh, and from planning board members from the last hearing that we've uh, looked at and come back with some comments for you guys here tonight. As Casey said, we also got comments from uh, the review engineer in town um, with the timing. And I, and I apologize to the board. I just didn't have time to get them back. They're finished last Friday but I talked to Robert and he didn't want me to kind of get something over to staff that you guys hadn't seen that they hadn't wouldn't have time to see. So um, I'm just going to kind of outline those couple items that I think the board members here were looking for at the last hearing and a couple of changes and then just open it up for any comments and discussions that the board has. Um, so we all know the site where it is here. Um, we kind of walked around it last time. We would like to put the second story addition with the bump outs here and the bump out on the other side. One of the questions was asked was landscaping in front of the building by the last board members there. We had not shown anything for that. So what we've done on the existing addition plan, nothing's really changed from the previous one that you had there. We've picked up a couple uh, monuments and stuff like that per O'Neill's discussion. One of the things that's come up um, just the other day with the applicant 
is that, um, and I haven't fully looked into this with the St. Gobain and the soil issues and and this is just something I wasn't thinking of. When we dig out for the foundation here, I'm going to have some extra material here, as well as over in this location here. The goal is that some of it will go into this location here, but I don't really want to raise this up too much or anything like that. I just kind of want to rip out the pavement and put it back. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to move the shed back in here, and we kind of see that this would give us an area to possibly put some of that material back in this location. Um, one of the things that changed from the last time you guys saw the site plan is that, oops, come back here, sorry. is that we had kind of like fenced in area in here and a fenced in area in the front here. Mm -hmm. um, we went to the Conservation Commission and uh, unbeknownst to me, when I had put those fence in there, obviously we were talking um, a vet clinic here and stuff like that, kind of assumed that that's what they would be looking for. But what was brought to my attention is that this isn't a doggy daycare or an animal daycare or that type of stuff. And what the big thing was is that if you're bringing your animal to a vet clinic, the vet, the doctors here that are online will explain, the last thing they want you to do is have your dog go poop or pee outside and not inside because they want to use these funky little tools that they have to collect the poop and collect the pee from the animals just like they do with us humans and be able to tell what's wrong with the dog or what's wrong with the uh, animal that they're taking care of. So we've removed those areas there because they're just, they're not play areas um, and they're not, that's just not what they do. If you take a look at um, the aerial photos that they had had at their existing site in a strip mall, um, there's no outside area like that. And they've been there for many, many years on that. So that's one of the changes we made. Uh, we talked to conservation commission. We went through with them. They were all set with, um, with us on the application. So that's one of the changes from the previous application. The other one is we added a handicap ramp along the front here to be able to access the building. There's currently a ramp that was going in the back, but it did not meet ADA requirements. Um, so we've got to obviously meet ADA requirements. I then took what was a handicapped space in this location here previously. And actually my guy didn't move the sign as you can see here. So I'm going to have to have a discussion with him tomorrow. That sign needs to be moved over to here uh, for the van. So I decided to put the handicapped space closer to the ADA ramp. Just made more sense over in that location there. So that was a change. We did add some snow storage areas. They weren't on the last application, but they're shown on this one that's here. And then the landscaping, again, I threw landscaping along the front of the building. That was one of the comments from the planning board. I also, as I told you, repositioned these three lights. Um, this one here is existing. This one here is new, and this one here is new. Um, just a little bit higher up. I was able to get rid of the poles that were out in the parking lot I'm um, just really not needed for this location and stuff like that. The rest of it's just our detail sheets and stuff like that. So again, pretty minor changes um, from when we were here beforehand. Again, I've addressed the comments that came from uh, Foss and O'Neill. We'll have them back to them tomorrow if there's no comments here tonight. Um, I will say one thing to the board. I noticed one of the conditions of approval or conditions recommendations is that the building be sprinklered. Um, we're not going to disagree with the fire department, but I, I just want to let the board know I'm going to put, I would like to put a note in the plan that once we get full architectural plans, that if they're still required at that point, we will. I think it's a based on the square footage and we just haven't finalized the rooms and everything yet. So it, it might drop under the 50% to have it sprinkled, but I'm not so sure. Um, it may still be, but I just want the board to understand that we're not going to go against fire department. We just might meet the requirement already is what I'm saying. Um, other than that, I'm going to keep it simple on this stuff here. I think everybody kind of saw it last time. We gave a good presentation and take any comments or questions you guys have. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, oh, uh, go ahead. There was one other I forgot. And that is, unfortunately, I got too many clicks up here. I can't see them all. We added the shutters to the building. That was one of the architectural questions that you guys had asked the last board member last meeting. Thank you for doing that. And that's it. Thank you. Um, thank you for going through the presentation and for attending to some of the details that we talked about last time. Um, we accepted the application as complete before, and that brings us to the point of um, considering your waivers. Um, and I want to let the board tackle that at the at the pace that they 
think appropriate, but for our benefit, can you introduce the waivers and what they're about and what the argument is in favor of them? So we're asking for the three um, that we had done last time on some of these other applications. Go to the internal, 8% of internal landscape area, uh, 15 shade trees, and then the perimeter landscaping. Uh, we're asking for a waiver from subsection I, 1, 3, and 5 of 3.11 of the parking. Uh, based on the existing layout of the parking and the current aesthetics of the property with the proposed fill in the landscape, k and believes the site plan meets the intent of the town's landscape requirements as such as requesting this waiver, again, for an existing established building, um, parking lot, and that type of stuff. We just weren't looking to rip out stuff that was pretty naturally established there. And again, redoing the stuff in the front that we did rip out. So we're asking for the landscape waiver on internally, which would mean cut out some pavement and put in a tree here. And then, you know, the buffer requirements of all the trees that would be around it there. All right. Thank you, Matt, for explaining that. Okay, planning board members, do you have any questions about either the waivers or the presentation in general? Nelson. Okay, I've got a few. Um, one of the things that we talked about last time, and uh, it was deferred to the engineering review, had to do with drainage on the parking area, on the paved area in the back. And um, I, I never saw the uh, engineering review, which uh, I'm sorry about. Uh, it'd be nice if we could get copies of those when they came available. But anyway, uh, where are we with that? Are we, uh, are we handling the drainage? Um, do we have it all captured? Uh, what's the runoff situation onto the neighboring properties? So because this is an established site here, we have an existing leach catch basin here, which uh, we went out there to confirm this thing's working and we need to replace the frame and grate. It looks like a uh, plow truck probably hit it this year and just kind of ripped up the front of that there. It's just the, the top grate. So we have a leach and catch basin here. We have a leach and catch basin over in this location as well. All of it's collected on site. Again, we have a reduction in the impervious because we're moving the pavement that's here. Uh, they've reviewed our drainage and stuff like that. And I didn't see any outstanding comments that they had from them. Nothing pitches off from these. They all pitch onto the site to the leaching catch basins. Okay, that was a, a question before, whether some of it pitched off site. And uh, of course, we haven't seen the uh, uh, drainage report from our consultant at that time either. Okay. So um, looks like uh, you know, if I face the building and I look at the, uh, first of all, I guess this new, th these uh, crosshatch areas represent new building construction. Is that what I see there? On this plan right here, this is yeah. our, my removals plan. So this is the areas oh, okay. that have to be removed to yeah. facilitate the site. Yeah. Okay. The addition okay. areas are here. Yeah. We have one here, the corner, uh -huh. and then the other one is right here that ties yeah. back to the front. Okay. And then what does the landscaping look like? Again, I saw about three bushes or something in the front. Nope. So we did the three, six, nine on this side here, another three, uh -huh. six, nine on this side here, another landscaping up in this location here, which this is all still landscaping and stays right in here, yeah. which you can see from the, uh, this right here. So all this vegetation in front here as well. That all stays. Yep. Yeah. So We've also right got here. some added vegetation on the right side of the driveway. And then we did the two trees here and that. We did the shrubs back up in here. Yeah. And then I wrapped around the trees and the shrubs. I mean, I tried to landscape as best I could. I just don't have a lot of area. And that's why the waiver request. Yeah. And um, the, uh, the dog park on the left side of the building as we're facing it in this view, the dog walk area, and it isn't sh that remains, I think, is what you were saying. No, is that right? there's no more dog walking areas. In the, any other place? No, yeah. exactly. They, they follow these dogs outside with the ladles and that and want to pick it up from that. Again, these they're not staying overnight and that type yeah. of stuff there. Yeah. Not a kennel. Okay. I'll, I'm all, all set then, Bob. I think uh, 
that answers the questions that I had on it. Uh, we got the street view, but those p plans you showed us, of course, weren't submitted to the board for review before this meeting. So certainly ours our preference to make sure that we're getting them ahead of time. But um, yeah, if the board feels we've got enough information, then um, we could consider voting. And if the board wants more time to digest these, obviously we can um, continue if that's what the will of the board. Um, it's up to you guys. Are there other questions that anybody has? If there's no questions, let's take a, any action that might be necessary on the request for the parking lot waivers, which are all related to landscaping. Mm -hmm. What's the will of the board on the request for waivers? Mr. Chairman, I would move that the staff, excuse me, that the board vote to approve the requested waivers uses, uh, utilizing the criteria from RSA 674 colon 44 that strict conformity would pose an unnecessary hardship to the applicant and the waiver would not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulations. Is there a second for Councillor Boyd's motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'll second it. All right, we'll count Alistair, even though I saw Nelson with a hand. Um, if there's no further discussion on it, let's do a roll call vote on that. Alistair, how do you vote? I vote aye, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Boyd? Boyd votes aye. Nelson Disco? I vote aye. Bob Best votes aye as well, 400 to grant the waivers that the applicant has asked for. Um, does the board desire any further discussion? We could certainly open it up and see if there's any public opinion. If there's no more discussion by the boards, are there any abutters or interested citizens who wish to weigh in and offer the board any advice? Um, Matt, or whoever's sharing screen, can you um, turn that feature off so I can see the people? Yep. Now I can see them. I don't see anyone with a raised hand looking to weigh in. Is that correct? I know that we did public testimony once before. So we'll close the public hearing. I know that we got a little bit of written support from a neighboring abutter and some general discussion, some light discussion last time. So uh, that'll satisfy our need for a public hearing. With that in mind, is the board prepared to take final action on this proposal? The staff's recommendation is that the board grant conditional final approval subject to the conditions in the memo. Um, what's the will of the board? Mr. Chairman, so, so moved per the memorandum of March 12th, 2021 to yourself and members of the board from Casey Wolf, assistant planner. Sarah, second. I'll second it if nobody else will. I'll second it, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Alistair seconds it. Um, I have one question. Um, Matt, in your presentation, you talked about the condition involving the sprinkler, and you said you'd do whatever the fire department wants you to do, but there may be an option depending on your size. Is Does that require any edits to the conditions that are in the staff memo in order to embrace what you offered for a solution? Um, it's 5A. Change. It just says a uh, change of use from resident property tire shall be protected by the NFPA 13. When I read the regs, it, it, it was, it just, there were three things and I just want to clarify with the fire department was all I was saying. So I felt like that staff and me could probably figure that out, but I just want it brought to your attention that. You know. I, think, I think you probably could, but it's important that we don't make it a concrete condition if we are expecting the staff to work it out with you. Um, so does it if we simply put uh, as this is reading what's written there in 5a as this proposal constitutes a change of use from a residential property to a veterinary hospital the entire building shall be protected by an approved nfpa 13 compliant fire sprinkler system if required by the fire department that'll work I just wasn't sure this was a residential now. I thought this was commercial already. So it just seemed a little vague. So I just wanted to follow up and I didn't have time. So that's perfect. If you just say it's required. It's required by the fire department. Okay, excellent. Uh, things I just rediscovered Bob, uh, sure, in going through the staff memo um, on page three, there is a series of things regarding the sanitary sewer engineering review. Um, 
and, and that's on page three of the staff memo, is saying that the sewer line is not shown. The commercial lateral line shall be a minimum of six inch pipe. No lateral, a lateral sewer clean out is provided and shall be minimized, whatever that means. Um, in a backwater valve, those, those kind of conditions um, are in the approval, I guess, as it's been moved by Mr. Boyd and seconded by Mr. Mills, by yourself. Um, Alistair counts as the second, I think, since what? he spoke up as I was offering a second. Um, yes, those um, things are in there, um, unless we decide to change them. Um, okay, I, I guess I just uh, wonder if the applicant had noted those things and was uh, comfortable and so we've already picked up the sewer uh, dpw got us a sewer line because of a change of use originally i just didn't show that line on there but they asked it for a comment so we we got it from dpw and put it on the plan oh, okay. i'm aware so, of these so i'm good with them you think you yeah okay i just wanted to be sure they weren't getting overlooked somewhere the pet waste management you did talk about on page five um it, uh, on item number two on page five talks about an as-built plan prior to the issuance of certificate of occupancy for the apartment building. Now, I, uh, good, catch. Uh, good, good catch, Nelson. <laughs> must have been lifted from somewhere. Yeah, that was, that was accidentally carried over. Okay, what should it say instead, I guess I would ask. Or the building, just delete apartment. You could get one. Do yeah. we need an ad, is there an as built plan required for this? Yeah. Uh, we take the staff's guidance with that. So, Casey, yeah. um, would we normally require an as built for this? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. Okay. Um. So let's approach this as a planning board and say that. Um, the general and subsequent condition two um, can also include an if required by the community development department. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think okay. that's good. Um, going back to page three, uh, C5, the sanitary sewer things, um, I think that backwater valve that's listed there is actually a backflow preventer or something. I don't know that a backwater valve is a thing. Backflow backflow preventer or something, some other similar name. Um, Nelson, did you have other comments? On uh, that? Back on page five, we took care of the apartment building. And, um, and then number four there says the applicant shall address the following and any forthcoming uh, comments from building department as related to building code compliance and permit application is applicable that are not just deemed precedent conditions. So I guess that's again, it would be at the discretion of the community development to decide whether something's precedent or. I think there's just a, a, a mirrored provision in the precedent conditions. And this is sort of the other half of it. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. And then, uh, Submit item number C, item 4C, submit a complete building permit application, indicate the scope of work, blah, blah. Um, I guess that would happen uh, after approval. In other words, our approval would take place, our approval of the site plan takes place before the submission of a building permit application. Is that yeah, that's why it would be that's why it's in this general and subsequent condition list uh, these all come after or potentially yeah, could come subsequent. after okay all right i didn't read the heading thank you that's all i have here thank you nelson for that um so we've made quite a few changes to the uh, conditions in the staff memo although they're all minor edits um now we've got to confirm with the maker of the motion and the seconder of the motion that it includes all of those edits bill yes not an issue. Alistair. I go with it, Mr. Chairman. 
Okay, so motion and properly seconded to adopt the to grant conditional final approval subject to the conditions in the staff memo as edited here tonight. Right. I'll go with that. That's what we're doing. Um, further discussion on that? If there's none, then Alistair, how do you vote? I vote aye, Mr. Chairman. Bill Boyd. Boyd votes aye. Uh, Nelson Disco. I vote aye. Just I conditional final approval to the applicant. Thank you very much. Welcome to town. I look forward to you uh, opening your Absolutely. doors and doing business. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you guys. Thank you, neighbor. Thank you very Welcome much. Have a good Thank night, folks. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Now I want to take up item five on our agenda before item number four, because I think it'll be a little bit more expedient to do it that way. Item five on our agenda is SJ Torres as the applicant and Connell Oren Family Trust as the owner. Review for acceptance and consideration of final approval of a waiver of full site plan review to construct an 1800 square foot outdoor patio. The parcels located at 454 Daniel Webster Highway in the C2 general commercial and town center overlay districts. Tax map 5D4, lot 54. Case Planning Board 2021-9. Uh, Casey, is there anything that we need to know before we hear from the applicant? Uh, nope. All right, Matt, this is you too. This is me. Point Sorry, of Bill. Personal... Yeah, Bill, what's up? Point of personal privilege. Um, looking at the project narrative that was included in our package, page four includes a check for the application and a receipt. Is any has any of this information that been made public because I'm concerned because the check, the ABA routing number and the account number was not redacted in my copy. Uh, to answer your question, oh sorry. So I just I just moving forward, can we make that a best practice that we redact something to protect any applicant if the applicant is paying by check so that we're protecting their privacy? Yeah, absolutely. I'll talk to both Tim and Robert about that. Okay, I appreciate it, Casey. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Bill. Good point. Um, frankly, I guess the, uh, I know the file has to have a copy of the check and the receipt. I don't know in terms of the material distributed to us whether we don't need it redacted, just to dump it. <laughs> don't need it at all. Yeah. Um, okay, with that in mind, Matt, what's up? All right. On to number two here. So um, good evening again, Matt Peterson with Keach Norsham Associates representing Tomahawk Tavern in the proposed patio edition. Uh, the site is located at 554 Daniel Webster Highway. Uh, Tomahawk Tavern is these last two units of this building here. Uh, this is the CVS building, the Domino's karate shop, uh, different types of uses that are in the building here. What we are hoping to do is utilize the back of this building that's here, that's underutilized right now. These pictures were from Google Earth, so I still have Frank's in it here. I didn't get the actual as they are there today. But I think everybody's pretty, you know, the last year that we've had most restaurants here, it's almost impossible to survive these days if they don't have some type of outdoor dining just to appease people on both sides of the spectrum on, uh, you know, trying to keep their business moving. So he came to us a couple months ago and asked if what we thought of possibly doing something like this. He worked with Steve Keach in my office and um, they came up with a plan that what we'd like to do is again, this is their back unit. We'd like to add a patio area to the back of that unit that's there. It's approximately 18 feet wide, which would leave 30 feet of travel space till, still to get by 81 feet long, actually 81 feet from this point to this point. We're talking something again, just added onto the outside of it there, some steps up, a little patio at grade that's here with an awning um, and a ma main awning. And we get the awning extension and the main awning here, and then pillars that will come down uh, around the whole outside of it that's there. So again, trying to utilize an area that at this present time is pretty underutilized. Um, you know, this right here is the automotive business behind it. I don't think there's a lot of through traffic, unlike the daycare that we did on the other one, where the, you know, around that side of the building actually had 
fronts for the retail and stuff like that, I think this is a pretty good location for something like this. And um, I went into this shop for the first time the other day and holy smokes, it looks amazing. So I want to be able to use the patio at some point it would be nice too. Um, we talked about parking from the old one. I'm not really sure at the end of the day, um, this is the old CVS plan. Parking calculations are a little weird. Um, they put existing here, required, and then provided. So my best guess is that you're required about 345 spaces. They proposed 254 at that time uh, was approved. What we'd like to do is very similar to the other site there. I tried to get um, as best a count as I could for each use that's there, the CVS, the base retail, AF, these ones here, ACF, um, and then the Domino's were those, the base retails at a convenience store. We've got the restaurant, the martial arts. Um, this is a medical practitioner that's in there, a day spa, and then the tavern itself. What I came up with with a requirement of about 291 spaces. And again, we've still got the 200. I've actually got three extra at 248. Um, oh no, I'm sorry, it was 254. So we're, we're short by about six spaces from that original plan. I'm not really sure where all those were at the beginning of the day anyway. Um, and I think most people that know this area, I, I get my dominoes here at lunchtime. I haven't really noticed major traffic um, issues in and out of this one here for the last 10, 15 years, but I could be wrong. Um, but again, this feels like a good location. Again, not a lot of traffic behind this building, unlike the other one. Everything kind of stays in front of it and utilizes it. And uh, we're here to hear your input and see what you think. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for the presentation. Um, I appreciate it. Um, it looked like you're adding a door on the side of the building that enters onto the patio. Yes. Good. It's definitely going to be much more convenient to have people be able to go out that door rather than come out the front and go around. Right. Um, is that for uh, wait, waiters or service or customers can just go out there and sit and self-serve oh, yeah. or yeah, you'd have to have access to the bathroom so it'd be everybody okay um is that outside patio going to be table service or is it just uh, self-serve you grab your food and you go out and sit wherever you want um that's a good question i'm under the impression it's table service because he was setting up chairs and that for the rest of it there so yes it, this is sit down yeah this is pretty fancy inside have you been inside here yet no, I haven't. Not since they changed it. And I'm okay. looking forward to it. It's My family a gets it. High end. It's kind of high end. It's a nice wood block tables and stuff, high, high steps and stuff like that. So no, this part of it is sit down restaurant. The butcher shop is more of your lunch. You can go in and sit at a, a table there, but awesome. this is sit down restaurant on the side. So um, typically when we're looking at sit down areas, our parking calculations are driven by the number of tables. Um, is there a sense of what we've got for tables and how that's worked with your parking, your proposed parking calculations? It has from my parking standpoint, um, not necessarily on how everything moves forward under different requirements on how to get, you know, back in the day, I'd put as many tables and tell you it's 40, 40 seats out here, uh, about 20 tables. If they got to be six feet apart, you know, it ends up being about 10 tables. If they can be three feet apart, which I'm talking about now, we're probably talking 20 tables. Um, so, you know, based on all those, it's, it's yeah, that's kind of where we had come up with the numbers um, for that. Okay. Well, I want to make sure you get the waiver that you need for the maximum number of tables that there could be there in the future. So you're not coming back to get amended approval because COVID's gone away and we can add a couple more tables. I put 130 seats. So I'm, we okay. More than that. We, we thought it was going to be about 100 when we kind of ran the numbers. So I just went conservative, like you said, so they didn't have to come back. Perfect. That works. Um, can you update the names of the businesses? I don't think there's a convenience store remaining in the mall in that shop. There is center. actually. Yeah. H&G is a convenience store. It blew my mind. It's still there, too. Um, it's right. It's these two right here, H&G. And let's see if I can show it on the right here. Brown's Discount Convenience Store. It's a discount store, but it's not a convenience store. I mean, oh, okay. maybe it's convenient to go in there, but it's what? not It's not a convenience store. What do you have it as? Is it alcohol? Um, I thought it was a convenience store. General retail. They sell, you know, 
whatever kind of objects that you want from oh, fusion okay. bowls to okay my bad bungee cords and weights and stuff village depot i thought it was more of a convenience store that's what my guys who went out there told me it was too but okay my bad. you know i understood that that's somehow a continuation of the kinds of things they used to sell at the old xylos um oh, okay. so a little of everything but um not not you know snacks and drinks and things like a convenience store um and then the other is um florence is has been gone for you uh, yeah. yeah and the only where i had the, the so i used the um it's still a restaurant in here and i used the cvs seats i assume they didn't change the seats when they reconverted so i don't think that they have although they're probably looking for some outdoor seating as well um yeah. and and um, I think this is a great location for the patio because whatever was there as pretend parking spaces were never parking spaces and they were never used as parking spaces. So you didn't really lose any by doing this. No, and if you look at the CVS plan here, they actually call them out just as um, future spaces. So they had it labeled right here, potential parking spaces future. And they had these ones and these ones. Now they misadded because there's six here and a couple that had nine, but. <laughs> they just for future. Yeah. Huh? Um, good, because those, you know, I'm glad they were never built. They were certainly were never used. And uh -huh. that's, uh, like you said, it's kind of a um, unused area behind the building. Um, I think it's a, a good proposal. I like outdoor seating. I like supporting it as much as we can. I don't think it'll impact anybody's parking to any degree. Um, I think, generally speaking, when you get behind CVS, those spaces are pretty available anytime that you'd want to go back there um so that seems like a good thing um do the other tenants uh, are they aware of the proposal and any impact it would have on them um matt do you know if yeah, the other tenants were notified i can't give you an answer on that um i notified of butters but you're right existing tenants in the building i i did not yeah they don't count as a butters because they don't own anything um and they're actually not abutting the parcel. They're on the parcel. Um, but I would think that they'd want to know whether it would have any impact on them or um, for the other restaurant, if there's a parking calculation going on, they're sort of competing with each other for those spaces. Although I don't think that we'd have any trouble with considering another outdoor dining in this place if there was if the other restaurant wanted one. Um, that's all the comments and questions I had. Do the other members of the board go in? <coughs> Okay. Nelson. Yes. Uh, a couple of things. I, I agree with you. This would be an improvement in the area in general and, uh, and um, a good utilization of space that's otherwise not utilized. Um, uh, just a couple of questions based on the uh, little sketch you showed, Matt, of uh, steps going up. Uh, is this... Um, addition going to be on a platform raised um let's see if i can find yeah this this view right here see those are four or five steps up there to get to the level that's a ramp right there what is a this will just be the handicap ramp so the goal is that this is at grade um okay you know but it might be up just you know i'd say probably a couple inches here like your sidewalk over here so it wraps around the sidewalk and comes down so just a little ramp here so we're saying like a reveal of probably six inches um okay i thought it was steps you know and then i thought what's the elevations here because you're just about at grade level with the existing tavern and this uh, i didn't get it but okay That's we're going to want to match this door elevation with this door elevation here so again they're you know a couple inches up from it, but basically at grade yeah. Now you've looked at your overhead space there to make sure you can get your awning, get the pitch on the roof and the intersection right where your arrow just was right mm -hmm. there on that corner. You know, you've got the, the awning is pitched toward the back of the house and yeah. Yeah. yeah pitch out this way out towards the drainage here. Yeah. You, you're okay with that. You check those elevations. Uh -huh and see that you can do it. Um, the other thing is, uh, I kind of disagree with your lack of use of that alley a uh, driveway uh, behind, uh, because if you get there at the right time, when the high school lets out, you'll discover there's quite a bit of traffic comes down through there. Oh, can they get there this way here? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. 
And uh, I think there should be something to protect people sitting there to, from getting run over. Now, I know it's not in the road, but um, it seems that uh, like we did on the other one, we put some bollards in or something. And I'm thinking we're going to have we're going to have um, stanchions at the end of this year. And we're going to we'd ra like to wrap them in some uh, um, brick around the bottom here just to kind of do that. So, yes. So this will be on the far side, probably one about midway too, and then one at the end that's there. And they're pretty far apart. You can get in between them pretty easily, right? Yes. Yeah, so we can agree to put something low along. The I think side. there should be something there to protect the people who are sitting to uh, watch the traffic go by. Um, yeah. I think. Um, to some extent, the protection is uh, visual. I mean, like if there was a, a short railing or something like that, that just kind of kept the tables from, you know, spreading out into the parking lot. Um, that could be helpful too, yes. Uh, I do want to point out that in the memo, uh, there is a condition currently that does ask for the protection. I did call the fire chief today to ask him what he was looking for. And, and what he said was uh, either bollards or uh, Jersey barriers, although he knows the, the Jersey barriers don't look as nice. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no Jersey barriers, please. Um, <laughs> and the the brick around the, the posts sort of are effectively a bollard if there were enough of them um, or curb wheel stops or, um, something that would uh, offer some protection would satisfy my my thought with that but um having some kind of a you know railing that makes it get a little bit of a visual like a cafe uh patio rather than just being a part of the parking lot with an awning over it um that's what i would make it a more pleasant place to sit i can tell the board that i'll be working with casey and the fire department to address their concern and make sure it's aesthetically pleasing and it's not jersey barriers Yes, that's it. Okay. There you go. Okay. Nelson, did you have more things on your mind? No, that's all I picked up on this site. Thank you. Does any other member of the board have anything they want to comment on? Bill. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Matt, just to let you know, I concur with, with a lot of my colleagues' comments tonight, especially as it relates to the bullet and the, uh, and the brick there. I think it's with the with the daycare center was a little bit more utilitarian i think with this there's an opportunity to do some aesthetics um but the, the the to me the driving point is the fact that you're building that patio out actually does create a little bit more of some traffic calming um than what you had there previously before because it was very wide now you're you're actually narrowing that road just a little bit so i think the idea of putting a patio there uh, actually dampen some of the traffic that that is going through there the only other um the only other comment that i had was regarding the audit if you said this i apologize because i was reading some of the stuff but what do you know what the color of the awning is going to be by chance that i do not um is sj does anybody know if sj is on the meeting with us here tonight. I can't see anybody's names after I went over here. I, I don't see that he's on. Okay. Or, or I mean, it's, someone should call him. We didn't call a color out, did we? Yep. Sorry, Bill, I don't have that answer today. That, that's okay. I just, it was more of a curiosity kill the cat kind of question. But um, I, I support the, I support the project. I think what what they've done with the with the old Frank's place and how they've reconstructed inside with the 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 dual deli uh, takeout spot with the uh, with the pub style restaurant on the inside, um, the outside seating last year was dynamite and the fact that they want to expand it I just think uh, gives more options to people here in Merrimack for for dining opportunities especially as as we emerge from the pandemic pandemic a lot of people are going to want to get out and get a bite to eat so I'm really happy. Uh, that the canals and, and Mr. Torres are, are proposing this project. Um, as I said, I support it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Anyone else with comments? Are there any of, actually, we didn't accept this first complete yet, have we? Um, what's the will of the board with respect to whether the application is complete? Mr. Chairman, I move, 
Mr. Chairman, I would move that the board accept the application as it is substantially complete and contains sufficient information to invoke the board's jurisdiction and to allow the board to make an informed decision. Excellent motion. Is there a second? I, Mr. Chairman, I'll second Mr. Boyd's motion. Alistair is a second. Um, let's do a roll call vote. Alistair, how do you vote? Yeah, I vote aye, Mr. Chairman. Bill Boyd, how do you vote? Boyd votes aye. But I have a question here. I think by doing this, we obviate the necessity to do a full site plan review, right? We're, we're kind of wavering that requirement by, as, by accepting this. To one degree or another, I think you're right. Um, okay. And Bob okay. Best votes aye as well, so that's 400. Uh, the applicant did request a waiver of full site plan review, um, and in, it's up to the board to decide whether to grant that or grant that in part. Um, if there was other information that we wish to see. Um, and to Nelson's point, um, the trick to that question is that if we don't waive the full site plan review, then the application isn't complete. So, right. But we've decided it's complete, so in some degree we're okay with that. What is the will of the board with respect to the waiver of full site plan review? Mr. Chairman, I would move that the board grant conditional final approval to we're the not, application. We're not there yet. We're still Sorry. Just Apologize. We've got a waiver and we've got to do public testimony. Oh, um, that's right. I apologize. Jump in the gun. Waiver of full site plan review is the question right now. Is the board willing to do that? I will. Yes. Oh, Bill Boyd's got the motion. Nelson's got, got a the motion. <laughs> All right. We'll count it. Alistair, how do you vote to waive full site plan review? No, no. I, wait, I waive the need for a site plan review. Excellent. Nelson? I voting aye on this motion to waiver full pl site plan review. And Bill Boyd? Boyd votes aye. Bob Best votes aye. We waive full site plan review 400. Are there any abutters or interested citizens who wish to weigh in? I don't see all the hands. Let me see if I can. Nobody is raising their hand. Star six is the way that you would raise your hand if you wanted to. And star and, nine. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for that, Justin. Star nine. And star six will unmute you. Um, star nine will raise your hand. Um, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. And now, Bill, if you wish to do so. Absolutely. Hey. Mr. Chairman, I move that the board grant conditional final approval to the application with the following precedent conditions to be fulfilled within six months and prior to the plan signing list. Otherwise, specify the eight plus four conditions outlined in the memorandum to you and the members of the planning board from Tim Thompson dated March 10th, 2021. Is there a second for Bill's motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we'll count Nelson as this one because I was looking that way. All right. Uh, Nelson's a second. Um, Alistair, how do you vote? I vote aye, Mr. Chairman. And Nelson? I vote aye. Councillor Boyd? Boyd votes aye. Bob Best votes aye as well. Four zero zero for conditional final approval. All right. I look forward to having a sandwich at the outdoor uh, the Tomahawk Tavern as soon as they can arrange it. Uh, thank <laughs> you very much. You, Matt. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay. Item number four on our agenda is RCL Realty LLC is the applicant and owner. Continued review for acceptance and consideration of final approval of an amendment to a previously approved subdivision. The parcels are located on Elizabeth Drive, Squires Drive, and Charles Road. In the R1 and R2 residential districts, tax map 3A, lot 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 25, 26, and 27. Case Planning Board 2021-7. It is continued from our February 16th planning board meeting. Casey, is there anything that we need to know before we hear from the applicant? Uh, no, not at this time. Excellent. Matt, is this you again? Yeah, you're stuck with me all night. No worries. What do we got? Where are we at with this one? All right. Again, Matt Peterson with Keach Nordstrom for the record, uh, representing RCL Realty for the proposed residential subdivision off Charles Road in Merrimack, New Hampshire. Um, board members that have been around for a while, which counts about all you guys, 
Um, this was here uh, one time in January of 2019 for a conceptual hearing. Uh, and then it was also back in January of 2020 for another conceptual hearing. Uh, that one, Steve Keach gave the presentation to you guys. And so here we are with a formal application. And what we are looking to do is this project is located off of Charles Road. Um, and it extends to Elizabeth Road. So this is Charles Road as it's coming down. This is looking back up towards Bates. Um, for the Elizabeth Lane that runs down there. This was a project that back in 1969 was approved uh, for the lots that are out here. We are in front of you tonight for this lot here which we've combined into this lot here because we had to do some stuff with the road. And then this lot here, these lots down along the side here, and two more off of Squires Road here. So what we're in front of the board tonight is for an eight lot subdivision um, or lot line adjustment, however you want to look at it. Um, we've got, the, like I said, there was two lots here that's now one. Here's a lot line that kind of got moved into this one here. So we get two lots on the north side of Charles Road, and then we've got our six lots, well, four lots on the downside of Charles, and then two lots off of Squire. To kind of clean this up a little bit for you, going through the process, this plan kind of shows you what has to happen to make that, those things happen. So first we start off with eliminating the kind of loop that goes all the way back around. Um, the grades and stuff here are might have been able to be constructed in 1969, but are more difficult in today's world with slopes and grades and stuff like that. So we are proposing that this here portion goes released and goes back to the units that are there. We are proposing that this little bulb in the cul-de-sac would be new at this location here for the end of ours. We are releasing this area in here um, that would go back and then we are taking the land that's here. The last place is up here on Squire Drive. Um, and again, we are releasing this to go back to 17 and to go back to 15. Now, one of the items that was brought up by staff um, at the previous hearing when we submitted this is that the down in this location on Squires, we had proposed an infiltration basin underneath this current call it right away, but it's not actually a right away, but you'd know it as a right away. So we propose this drainage under, but unfortunately, you kind of get stuck between the chicken and the egg on which comes first. If we deed these back to the owners, then we can't do an easement over it because we'd have to get this owner to be okay with it. And that just doesn't make sense to make him come back and forth and do that. Um, if we do the easement beforehand, there's some questions with council, whether or not that can or can't be done there. So one thing I did over the last uh, couple of weeks since when we looked for the application acceptance last time and come back here is I just got this off the table. Um, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. So we are now making a clean break of this piece here that would go back to 3A-17. We are proposing the infiltration basin at the end here. This infiltration basin is really nothing to do with our project per se. It's mostly to do with the water that's running down currently off Elizabeth um, and has no place to go and wasn't really designed correctly and just kind of dumps out. So we're actually infiltrating that water that's coming off the pavement back into the ground. Um, one of the things that I do know is, an, is a concern with some of the people in the uh, neighborhood. And again, tonight, my goal is to just kind of give you guys an overview here. I know there's a lot of people in line that probably want to have some things to say and I'd like to get their um, input and then kind of come back to you with, with answers and stuff like that. But I know that there's a way to get down to, I guess, to the right of way um, or the power lines that people would like to walk through here. Um, you know, this right of way is gonna be given back to a landowner that's part of the association. He could, he could do an easement over this or give rights to it and stuff like that. I don't have that option there. We can do something on the other piece there, but I know that they would like to still get access down to here. And again, I think at the end of the day, we can figure something out, a way to do that um, with this property that we're there. So just to kind of walk you through the plan set that you guys have. So as I said on the color up, 
lots are pretty clean what we were looking at um, I know there were a couple comments from staff on setbacks we've been kind of going back and forth um, on a couple of these projects with the zone being one thing but because there's no sewer and water it needs to have a different um, setback so we'll work with staff on that it's not an issue I just have to change those to modify them the next sheet in your plan set is our topographic subdivision plan this is where we've dug our test pits to prove out our 4k areas for state subdivision approval. Um, we do have town water, but we will have on-site septics with these. So again, we've done test spits and our 4K areas to prove those. Um, this is the profile coming down Charles Road. Um, what was brought to you guys' attention back in January of 2020 was what they were gonna be looking for a 9% for about 15 feet. Um, in this location here. It hasn't changed from the plan that they showed you previously. Um, this plan does show you the existing grade that comes down here and does this and keeps coming down here. Um, so again, we're filling quite a bit in this to kind of come over the top and then filling as we come down here and around the corner. It gets clean down at the bottom here. Again, the dotted line is the existing conditions. Uh, we have a little knoll to take out here, but that's basically coming around the cul-de-sac. 1.5%, 3.9%, 3.9%. Again, that comes to 39 comes down, comes back around the cul-de-sac and back up. And that knoll you're seeing is basically in here that we are looking to remove. I just talked about the Elizabeth Drive, um, and we also are cleaning up and teeing up this intersection here. So we're making Elizabeth and Charles a 90 instead of this gradual sweeping 8% uh, grade that's there currently. Uh, we want to bring it to a stop condition. Uh, I think it's a lot cleaner at the location here with that once we go through the project. And then we've got an access down. We had to show potential access to this extension. Uh, we've shown that on our plans as a future build out um, and that's in the set. Erosion control, typical stuff that we have for our erosion matting, jute matting, our different detention ponds. Um, this does require uh, alteration of terrain. We have submitted everything up to the state. Um, you know, with COVID, it seems to take a little bit longer um, for them to get the reviews and go through it. So I have not received any comments yet from that. Um, as, as you guys know, we did get some comments from your review engineer. Um, I did get to work through those, but uh, like, like the last, I'm just, buried right now and didn't get them back to staff in time and that's on me I apologize and we're not here for approvals or anything like that anyway we'd love to get acceptance tonight hear the abutters comments and kind of go from there the rest of the plan sets just my construction details um, so I'm not going to bore you guys with that stuff that's there and I think at this point I'd like to uh, my client is on tonight if there's certain questions you'd like him to answer but again I think I'd like to hear some of the comments and questions from staff and board and all that and uh, go from there. So thank you. Thank you, Matt, for the presentation. Um, I have uh, two comments, although one of them is a little tongue in cheek. When you mentioned that it was originally approved in 1969, I think you forgot to mention that that was on a motion by Nelson Disco and seconded uh, by Pete Gagnon, <laughs> right? That would have been good. Is that true? <laughs> Probably so. No, it was not. It did precede me. <laughs> it did precede me. Oh. All right. Wow, we finally found a project that precedes Nelson. There you go. Um, so. you're, you're a bad man, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you for entertaining my little joke. Um, <laughs> the, more, the more relevant comment, um, I appreciate the uh, willingness of the developer to take a look at Squires Drive and how there might be a way to work with the residents to find some access to the power lines. Um, I'm always encouraging applicants to do what they can to be neighborly and to be good citizens. Um, but I always also have to take uh, the opportunity when necessary to make sure to be clear that such a thing um, I don't believe is within the planning board's jurisdiction to consider or to require. Um, we're certainly glad to have applicants that are um, looking to uh, be good neighbors, as I mentioned. Um, but uh, I, I, access to a power line easement, which isn't a recreational facility um, that we could recognize, um, is not something I think we could demand of you as an applicant. Um, I'm glad that you're willing to work with the neighbors, though. 
Um, with that in mind, let me open up the discussion to any other members of the board who wish to comment or weigh in on things. Let's see, let me fix my screen so I can see everybody. Um, Nelson, okay. Hand up. okay, I'm going to start off by disagreeing with you. <laughs> uh, uh, I think that the people who uh, purchased in here and, and uh, assumed when the uh, original, according to the original layout, that they had a, an access to that easement or at least a uh, uh, taking something away if we, uh, if we don't preserve that access. So I would be very much inclined to find some way to uh, allow that access to happen. So that would be my thought on that. The rest of this is really tough land to work. It's very hilly, very uh, a lot of steep, a lot of, uh, of uh, sl uh, heavy slopes with uh, lots of uh, grading to bring the thing into some uh, degree of uh, conformance with what would be a normal road. Um, you, you talked about the 9%. Um, Matt, uh, the 9% grade, is is that on Charles Road in the new portion of Charles Road, or is it in the existing portion of Charles Road? You know, oh, there, there. No, you, hold on, hold on, right here. Yeah, hold on so back. Yeah. this here is at station 425, say. Okay, let's go to 425. That's gonna, be, that's gonna be our new, so 425 is about here, and Charles can, ends right up in here so no it, it's in our new roadway okay and uh this is the charles that go around going around this by pointing you can't see it um charles road to the right goes up the hill is that right is um that it comes down to a bar to a low point and then the next sheet which is this part here yeah kind of goes down to a low point Right, right uh, about here, our catch basins, and then comes back up again yeah. over in this location. Yeah, yeah well, you can see you've got some slope easements needed there in these lots and everything to get yeah. get the uh, get the grades right. So, this how long is the stretch of road that's nine percent? You uh, so technically it's only from station four plus ten to four plus twenty five because as soon as you get past this point it drops below nine percent as soon as you get past this point it drops below nine percent so it's nine percent for 15 feet and then your curve is making its way back up to this half oh, a percent yeah. that's up here 15 feet wow i mean that's <laughs> okay thank very you small. you've answered my question thank you very small very minimal area all right uh other members of the board that wish to comment um, Bill, what you got? Um, it's, it's more of a question to, to Matt. Looking at Squires Drive, specifically Parcel J, the right of way to be released from dedication, who, who currently owns that? We do. Okay. So once it once it's released from dedication, am I reading the plan correctly that it's proposing to be attached to map three A lot seventeen? And that's why I couldn't get an easement. I couldn't put the detention pond on that and get an easement later because I couldn't get I couldn't put an easement on it and then say, oh, here you go, with it. Um, I mean, Greg Michael thinks maybe we can. Staff says no. It just wasn't worth the headaches. So my my question to you is. How difficult would it be to make that a conservation easement and deed it to the town? So instead of dedicating that portion and attaching it to 3A17, just keep that separate. It's green space. It allows people access the easement necessary to get to do their open. And that might potentially give you some flexibility to develop your drainage easement. It's a, it's a good idea. I didn't think of that. I. I... I know that giving stuff for conservation, had to a holder for it or stuff like that, there might be some legal stuff I need to look into, but that, that's a pretty good idea. I don't disagree with you on the legal stuff, but it just was kind of sitting here that it's already been mapped out. 
Yep. You certainly don't want to, the abutter is going to be taking on a piece of property that's going to um, create create some potential tax implications that, that he or she may not want. But if it's retained by the town and it solves the problem based on some of the, um, the abutter uh, letters that we've received, have you seen those, Matt, by chance? I have not yet, no. It, it, uh, sidebar, Mr. Chairman, is it possible that the applicant could be made privy to the uh, the letters that we received? Of course. Of okay. course. Um, I, I would, it, it, unless they came in late, it would be the normal course of things that the applicant is receiving those objection letters. Okay. Um, so so. so that, to, that to me would be a potential remedy to solve the problem, Matt. Yeah, I you know, and, and, and the other flip of the coin is as it relates to parcel H, and I, you know, I hate to do this, but if you had to reconfigure 3815 to meet specific, you know, area requirements, if it was looking to be something a little bit more bigger, at least you had something, you, you would still have something there, I would think, to work with to, to make that accommodation. But I'll, I've given you the conception, you understand it, I'll let you do, speak with your client and figure out if it's something that's doable. I will. Otherwise, that, that's really all that I had. Thank you, Bill. Um, other members of the board with comments or questions? So um, if if Bill's thought went forward, how does that 3A15 have frontage on a roadway? Um, I think that got the variance. I have to follow up on it because it doesn't have frontage right now. Yeah, it's got frontage on nothing. Um, if that so little bit of squire right now, we got frontage it. right here. So we had frontage here. That was a variance. So I, I'd have to. Um, okay. Like if I they've saw, gotten a variance to allow that bit of frontage to work, then that answers right. my question. But I think what he's saying is just this half of it. Yeah, just parcel J. Yeah. Well, Mr. Chairman, just parcel J. But if if they needed to widen. Yes. We that green space, they, they, yeah. they could adjust the lot line on the north on the on the northeasterly side of parcel H and swing that swing that from northeasterly to a northerly position, oh, which would yeah. widen that add additional width to parcel J. So it gives them some flexibility for that kind of, but potentially for that conservation easement and maybe a little bit more latitude with their drainage easement. Yeah. They still would retain the frontage down on on that little spur coming off of uh, between yeah, Charles yeah. Road and Elizabeth Drive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I get what you're saying. And I think it's a, a pretty elegant solution in the sense that the 3A17 doesn't have to worry about whether he's got any concerns exactly. about making his property open to the public. Yeah. Um, which, you know, there's ways mm -hmm. to work around that. Well, it's not a, a monumental and, and, concern. But and, and, no and, and just for the record, that applicant did submit a letter in, and, and uh, the app, that that letter writer had expressed a desire to keep that area open for for green for green space, so that people could go in there and and walk around behind the property along the power lines. So, yeah, understood. Th th there's a potential solution there, I think. Other comments or questions by members of the board? Okay. Um, Bill, as you mentioned, there are quite a few correspondences from various abutters, and some of them are at some length. Um, I know that they've been distributed to the board members. We'll make sure that they get distributed to the applicants. Um, I want to vary a little bit from a, um, a, it's not really a requirement or a normal approach, but it's sort of our habit um, to read into the record such correspondences. Um, the volume of these just simply don't permit it. Um, so they certainly are part of the record by virtue of having received them. The board members all have them and they can review them um, and we can uh, apply them uh, as we see fit. Um, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, I, I would actually move that, that the comments actually be tacked on to the backside of the minutes in its entirety. Um, which comments are those that you mean? So I mean, like the like the letter from Mr. Souter, the letter from uh, the, the a, a longer letter from uh, there are eight there are excuse me there are eleven names that are attached 
to this particular letter dated uh, February 11th? Um, I would suggest that it's up to the board what you want to do. Um, okay. It certainly makes sense to identify the correspondences received in the minutes, a letter from so-and-so on such and such a date, so that they're identified to exist. Um, but we'll have minutes that are 150 pages long um, if we simply attach them to the minutes. And we, we have not taken that approach in the past to okay. attach those comments. But if it's the will of the board to see them attached, there's certainly no reason why we couldn't do it that way. I'm just trying to think of um, what's useful to the future minutes. Um, does anyone else have any comments on the idea of the public comments? Nelson. Yeah, I, would, I was just going to make a suggestion with regard. The minutes could call out each individual about her letter by name and date and so on, and then have it in the file at the planning office. Yeah. And solve your problem of reproducing 150 pages for everybody. That was what I was thinking as well. Yeah, I think that that should work and should okay. meet yep. Bill's requirement or suggested okay. requirement. Okay, with that in mind, then we've at least identified that we've gotten those pu those public letters and that input. Um, let's go ahead and take any other public testimony that uh, anyone desires to give um, to the board. If you are on the call or on the Zoom and you wish to be recognized, press star nine to raise your hand if it's by telephone. Um, if it's by Zoom, um, you wouldn't do that. Looks okay, like I see the one phone number, uh, one person by telephone ends in 862 uh, has raised their hand. So I'll call on you, press star six to unmute yourself and then don't uh, forget to identify yourself by name and address um, and then offer the board any testimony you'd like to give. Hi, this is Bruce Peterson, 3 Elizabeth Drive. Um, I'm sorry that, uh, well, I'm not sorry you got 150 pages of letters. It seems like quite a bit, but um, I'm sorry you're not able to read any of them. But um, si since nothing is going to be read out loud, but one thing we would request if maybe the board would consider a site walk so you can at least see firsthand what our issues are. And at the same time, maybe we can see what the resolution is from the applicant um, what Mr. Boyd was just talking about. Uh, so that would be nice if you guys would cons at least consider sometime in the future a site walk. Um, so I, and I have to respectfully disagree with the chairman that we think and agree with Nelson after 50 years of using a certain road, that's an open space and a trail to more open space. Um, I would think that should be considered and I think it should be the planning board's um consideration to 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 consider that if with the neighborhood and when we talk about the health and the welfare and the safety of the residents i think that should be included in part of that um one thing i would like to focus on is why they even need to undedicate squires road or squires drive to begin with we don't really understand why and the the reasons that they say don't really make any sense to us they talk about uh, harsh terrain and, and topography and substantial ledge. And they combine that with lots 13 and 14, which makes sense for those two lots because they're undedicating the unpaid portion of Elizabeth Drive. But lot 15 has no, and they, they're they saying it does, but it has no frontage on Elizabeth Drive, either the paid portion or the unpaid portion. So to group those that lot 15 with the other two lots to justify why it's um, a hardship and why they have to do it makes no sense at all to us. And we're still trying to understand why they need to undedicate Squires Drive for lot 15. It, we, the only thing we can see that it's doing is they're creating a driveway to go down along Squires Drive to enter lot 15 further down Squires Drive. And so they're using a driveway instead of Squires Drive to do that. That's the only benefit of doing that other than the only thing we can see, and it was made, it was commented at the conceptual discussion over a year ago that Matt mentioned, is that the applicant doesn't want to build out Elizabeth Drive. That's the reason that they're doing it. 
so they kind of hid the reason they did it, combining the reasons with 13 and 14, which don't apply to Lot 15. So we're not really sure the real reasons. We know the real reason, but we're not really sure the, the practical reasons or the legal reasons why they want to uh, take over Squires Drive. So that's what we'd like to have. One of the things we'd like to have the applicant really explain specifically Lot 15, why it needs to be adjusted to take over Squires Drive or half of Squires Drive and go from 200 feet of frontage, which it has on Squires Drive right now, to 25 feet of frontage on their proposal on the Elizabeth Drive. Doesn't make sense the character of the neighborhood at all. So that's one thing we'd like to have explained to us. Um, I don't know if this is appropriate during this during a planning board meeting, but the applicant has, and if it isn't, please let me know. But the applicant has has talked about the values of the surrounding properties won't be diminished, but they only said they're only going to look at lot 17 and 24 when they answer that question to justify why they need the variances, which we don't feel is correct. Um, the applicant stated that it's under uh, unnecessary hardship that the front, this is a, from the minutes of the ZBA, the frontage of lot 15 cannot be improved without the requested variance because of a substantial presence of ledge in the harsh terrain and topography. We have no idea what they're talking about. And they're talking about the, the lot 15 cannot be, the frontage cannot be improved. Well, it's at 200 feet right now and they're going to 25 and they say they can't improve it because of harsh topography and terrain and the presence of ledge. Again, I believe they combined it with 13 and 14 and kind of hid it in there when they did the presentation. There's, there is no reason to, for the requested variance, which is to expand that lot into Squires Drive and go from 200 feet to 25 feet is illogical on their presentation. They said they can't expand it because of the terrain, but they went from 200 down to 25. Doesn't make sense. Um, and if they're talking about the topography and the terrain of lot 15, it's not harsh by any means. It's 12 to 16 grade. The terrain is actually relatively flat. There's no mounds and undul undulating uh, surface area there. And there doesn't appear to be any ledge on that lot. And that was indicated also by a concessional discussion by the engineer. And if you look at test pit one and test pit 10 results, you see they went down to six feet and hit no ledge at all. The applicant has also stated that the public works has repetitively indicated that they are not interested in seeing Squires Drive built to maintain in perpetuity for one lot. That's a quote. So we requested from BW all the correspondence relative to this project. And after reviewing that documentation and talking to Kyle and Don from DPW about this claim, we find no evidence of this at all. Also, Brent Cole at the conceptual discussion and I believe Attorney Michael has also mentioned a trouble spot for Lot 15, which is really the transition off of Squires Drive down to Lot 15. Let me give you a little bit of history. When the water pipe was placed under Charles Road and Elizabeth Drive a number of years ago, all the ex excavated debris, including large rocks, dirt, and asphalt, were deposited on the Squires Drive. EPW told us that Mr. Patterson requested that this debris, this debris be put on Squires Drive. So we ended up with an extremely high and long pile of debris, which encompassed a large portion of Squires Drive. None of this debris was used by DPW to improve the turnaround at the end of Elizabeth Drive or any other purpose. It was all used by Mr. Patterson. So eventually this debris was bulldozed onto the top of a large section of Squires Drive and this event created a very large drop-off from Squires Drive to Lot 14 and a large portion of Lot 15. So access to Lot 14 from Squires Drive was now, is now practically impossible. And we created a troubled, quote, troubled area referred to by Brent. And it was created at this time when they did that. So as we look at it, we have two issues, two sides to this issue. One side is the health, the welfare, and the safety of the community. And the other side is the unexplained reasons, at least us, by the applicant of why they are taking over to Squires Drive. 
to us, it seems apparent why the applicant combined lot 15 with 13 and 14 and justifying why they need a lot adjustment with reduced redu um, frontage from a conforming 200 feet to 25 feet because they have no valid reason for justification. So that's why they did that. So what's, what is the apparent reason? It seems obvious to, the, to us that the applicant does not want to bear the cost of building out Squires Drive. They evidently think it's an unnecessary hardship, but we think it's a necessary hardship. I'd like to move on off of Squires Drive and, and talk about utility poles. Is that okay to talk about that on this? Yes. I want to make sure that we're doing our best to um, take in the testimony that you've offered and connect it to things that the planning board can consider. Um, and in that regard, I don't know if it's helpful to you if we discuss the items sort of as you go through them or whether you want to get through everything you have to say and then um, we'll see where that leads the discussion. What's better for you? It would be helpful to, to uh, talk about it right now. Okay. Um, some of the things that you discussed um, about variances and arguments about variances and justifications are um, uh, items that are the, the zoning board of adjustment would take up or perhaps has taken up. Um, and those are not for us to weigh in on or consider. Um, they're outside of our jurisdiction. Um, in so in terms of frontage or lot 15 and, and those sorts of bits. Um, okay. The question about uh, dedicating Squires Drive, um, you know, uh, you make good points. Um, I think that the applicant seems to be open to considering doing something different with Squires Drive than was originally proposed. So you may have that solution um, before. Um, in terms of the applicant's motivations for um, wanting to do a particular thing with their proposal, um, I, I know that it helps to understand it as an abutter to think in terms of what's their justification for doing certain things. Um, as far as the planning board's approach to that goes, um, the applicant's free to propose whatever they want to do on private property. Um, if it complies with the regulations, then we evaluate it for that. Um, so in terms of the applicant sort of justifying a choice that they make, um, the only thing that they owe us an explanation on is whether and how it fits in with what our regulations require. Um, so our focus is a little bit different. And the reason for going through that explanation with you is um, it helps us receive your testimony if we're able to understand what its connection is to some of our, um, in this case, subdivision regulations um, and the things that we regulate. Um, I, I would imagine that that's not necessarily um, the fullest answer that you were looking for. Um, and I'll let the applicant respond to all of your comments when you're done or all of any public comments when you're done. Um, but uh, in terms of from the planning board, um, I think that's what I can offer to you based on the comments that you've provided so far. Um, as to who's right or wrong about whether the planning board has jurisdiction over certain things, it's an academic question if the applicant's willing to voluntarily do a thing. Um, it, as to a legal question, it's not really open for debate. Um, but if the applicant's willing to do it voluntarily, it, we don't have to solve that problem. Um, so it's not under the purview of the, uh, of the planning board to consider uh, the health and welfare of the community um, by taking away the open land there that's available sure. to our community? Yeah. I can address that. Um, the planning board statute does have within it, the purposes of the planning board is to consider those things. And I think actually health and safety may be actual words that are in the statute in terms of the planning board's purpose. That doesn't necessarily translate into what we can require someone to do on private property. Um, it's great that the residents have had the benefit of using somebody else's property um, for recreation. Um, but it doesn't compel us or even give us the right to require a private property owner to continue that. Um, right. So is, is Squires Drive then considered a private property? Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. So it's a, it's a right away on private property. Is that what it is? It's what we call a paper street. It was proposed to eventually become a street. 
and if it had been built, um, then the applicant could have asked the board to recommend to the town council that it be accepted as a public road. It, had all of that occurred, it could have matured into being a public right of way. And actually, it would be labeled as a class, probably five highway um, if it had been built. Um, has it, because it was never built, um, it was never proposed to be um, uh, made into a public road. That's what makes it a paper street. So it exists and it's got this sort of limbo status. Um, the, but it's not deeded to the town. It's not dead. Applicant continued forward or accepted Councillor Boyd's suggestion. It could become public land. Um, but right now its mm -hmm. status is owned by this applicant. One okay, of the reasons thanks. why they've got to resolve that situation is that when they finish with the subdivision and these lots, whether they're the new modified ones or the originally approved ones, ultimately the, the developer doesn't want to own 30 feet of roadway in a neighborhood that he has nothing to do with anymore. So one way or another, the, the roadways have to either become roadways or end up in somebody else's hands so that when the project's over, the developer doesn't have to um, remain a, a part of the community. Um, what are those options? A million okay. different options for how that could go. Uh, public, open space, roadway, given back to the underlying lots, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, also in the uh the longer letter, I guess, that you received, it kind of explained, going back to the health and safety and welfare of the neighborhood and what the neighborhood enjoys today with the unpaved portions of Elizabeth Drive and Charles Road and Squires Drive and then the, the community passageway to the power lines and such. Um, all of that pretty much goes away, all of it. And what we're left under this proposal and what we're left with is what we consider probably a kind of unsafe road uh, when they pave Charles Road going down that hill and going to the cul-de-sac. That's what we're left with after what we've been enjoying for 50 years. So I think that it has a, you know, when they say it doesn't have an impact on the, on the neighborhood, well, actually it does. And it's a big impact. Um, so hopefully you can consider that looking at the whole picture of what's there now and then what's proposing and what would be left afterwards and for kids to play. Um, and it's not just the passageway to the, but it's also the Squires Drive. Most kids go up and play in that Squires Drive area because of the grade of Elizabeth Drive right now, today where, they, where it meets Charles Road in that curve. And evidently they're gonna make the grade even worse um, under this proposal where Elizabeth Drive meets Charles Road. So that's even a bigger concern with a bigger reason why people would want to be at the other end. So hopefully you can consider that looking at the whole picture of the impact on our little community here. And in the also, if I may add, in the uh, paper, it talked about how why we're isolated, why we feel we're isolated, because Bates Road, um, if you read the letter, Bates Road is kind of a dangerous road. It's Kids will not play. You cannot send your kids to play on Bates Road. It's too dangerous. There are no shoulders. The telephone poles are too close to the pavement. Uh, it's going downhill. Cars are going fast. It's a blind spot there. So it's it's actually kind of dangerous for people, adults, to walk on it. Um, so that's why we feel like we're isolated and why it's kind of a, very important to us. While we're losing all this green space, open space under this proposal in and being isolated because of Bates Road. Uh, so hopefully you can consider that the whole picture. I'd like to move on uh, if, we're, if we're done with this area and just talk briefly about utility poles. Yes, please. So they're proposing to uh, put utility poles down, I think four poles down the, um, the new Charles Road, a paved section of Charles Road. And for some reason, one pole at the end of Elizabeth Drive with no apparent power going to it. So we're not really sure. First of all, Normandy Estates today is all powers on the ground. And so we're not really sure. And I, I called Eversource and I said, well, why is it necessary to install utility poles on Charles Road? And he said, 
He didn't know. He said it was only under extenuating circumstances would they install utility poles. And uh, he couldn't find any job, open job about it. And he said, if I can get a Eversource contact uh, that I can give him, that he can get me more information about that. So that's a question I have from Matt that he can answer in either now or give it to me, give us later. The Eversource contact that's evidently, and maybe I can, Matt can just talk briefly about why the utility poles are going down Charles and why there's a utility pole at the end of Elizabeth Drive and why there's a, a power line coming out of the utility pole that's on the corner of Charles and Elizabeth and going north on Elizabeth Drive and just ending some pole. Uh, sure what that is. Uh, I see there's a waiver for extending electric, but they don't really describe what that really means. Um, so if maybe you he can address that. that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I'm writing that down in my notes, so I'm making sure that I ask the applicant to address it. Um, when we do the public testimony, it's you know, you, you're giving it all to us, and then we can you know shape it up and and uh, ask the applicant. But it isn't an opportunity for you to directly ask the questions. But I'm gonna and thank okay. you for bringing that one forward. I can tell you our regulations uh, don't permit above ground utility poles in a subdivision without a waiver. Um, of that provision of our regulations. And um, I know from my own experience with this and some things I've heard from other board members, uh, the applicant better have a whale of an argument for doing above ground utilities in a subdivision. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. There are, you know, there are, there's an agreement that we have with PSNH now Eversource in 1972 with the, all the easements we have through the whole Normandy estates to bring, and that's where the power gets to all the lots and easements also including their lots down uh, on those proposed lots and also over lot 15 is an easement over there for power. So we're not really sure why they decided to bring power down Charles. I, just, I know Eversource has been wanting to upgrade the power grid in the Normandy estates. And I think this is, to me, it's, to us, it seems like kind of a backdoor way to get to do it cheaply, if you will. So it would be interesting to hear what they have to say about that. Thank you for writing that down. Um, uh, Charles Road, the Charles Road that they're proposing. I, I don't have to tell you this. I guess you know it already. That you know we we don't see even we don't even see a request for a waiver for sidewalks. We uh, we know that they know that there should be sidewalks there. We, Think that they'd have to at least put a waiver in. I'm not sure why they didn't do that. Um, the utility pole is too close to the road. Uh, guardrail on one side, which indicates that there's, there's a drop off, and that's why they're putting a guardrail on the other side of, the, of Charles. They're putting t telephone poles too, they want to put them too clo closer to the pavement than standard. And I believe they're doing that because the, the land is sloping down to the road. The no shoulders, a seat grade, a sweeping right turn, a sweeping right turn from a steep angle. We kind of think that's kind of a disaster for a restaurateur disaster. And uh, we see what, what Bates Road is like, and those are the similar conditions. Now, this road won't be as busy as Bates Road, but there will be have to be kids on this road. Kids will be walking up and down this road to go to the bus stop on the corner of Charles Road and Bates Road. It just seems like, I don't know, crazy. <laughs> it's a, on paper, at least it does. Maybe it's not as bad. And there doesn't even seem to be a jump off for a pedestrian to get off the road. There's no shoulders, the guardrails are sloping on the other side. Where do you go if you're on a bicycle or you're walking? So that's a concern of ours and hopefully, and I know you will address it. So I would appreciate that. Um, I guess maybe what you said earlier doesn't, these are the couple of questions we have that doesn't apply to the planning board, but we wanted to know what are the reasons lot 15 needs to take over that land from Squires Drive? Is that coming under your purview or not? That's just a question we have, whether it's appropriate or not for you, is that's for you to decide. We, and we thought that, you know, when this goes to the town council and they, they have to be the ultimate approval of on dedicating Squires Drive, that we thought that there has to be a reason why 
they're going to un- they want to take that land. That's just because we want to make our lot bigger. There has to be some purpose. So sure. we, we are. So I, I hope they get asked. What is? Oh, go ahead. Um, I I want to provide what little information I can, and it's not a complete answer. Um, whether they have to go to the town council to deal with Squires Drive or not depends on what the legal status of Squires Drive currently is. Um, the applicant, as a paper street, um, with which which the applicant owns, there's at least a possibility that it doesn't require town council approval to undedicate it because it's never been dedicated. Um, but I don't know the I don't know the legal status. The applicant's going to have to sort that out and satisfy our legal counsel um, as okay. to why Thanks. they want to take part. part of it. Uh, uh, and the applicant is appearing before the zoning board, which I assume they have since by the discussion that you've had, um, they're asking for a variance from various regulations and they've got to justify those kinds of things. Um, with the planning board, justification is not necessarily part of the puzzle. The applicant has private property and they can propose to use it as they choose if it fits within our regulations. Um, and so once the variance has been granted for lot 15 in its configuration, um, we accept it as um, being a now legal um, uh, layout for a lot um, because the zoning board has granted it a variance from the regulations. Um, other than that, to us now, it's just one of the other, you know, what do we got here? Seven, eight lots. Um, and its configuration isn't, doesn't have any more significance than that to us. Had they not gone to the okay. zoning board, then we would look at it and say, you don't have enough frontage for that lot. It's not a legally conforming lot and you can't build it. Um, but since the zoning board's taken that decision and granted a variance, um, that question is, is resolved in the other direction. I believe um, that I'm not a lawyer, so I don't really understand it completely, but I believe uh, the variances from the zoning board were approved with conditional approval from the lot adjustment from the planning board, something to that effect. And yep. every one of them had a conditional approval. So is that is that standard and that, that um, you, and you that means if you don't approve it for some other reasons, then the, the variance is taken back. Yes, that's exactly what it means. Okay. But it doesn't allow okay. us to revisit the same question that the zoning board decided. Um, so if we okay. decided for other reasons that this is, you know, doesn't conform to our subdivision regulations, um, then essentially this thing goes back to the state it was in when 1969, when it was originally approved. And the applicant can come forward with something different as a proposal for what to do about that. Okay, thanks. Um, um, when they, one of the issues we saw, unfortunately, for a number of reasons, we were, the whole neighborhood was behind the eight ball with the ZBA and we're trying to be ahead of it with the planning board. Um, and there's other unfortunate ways it was presented at the ZBA, which we'll have to take up with some other venue. but. One of the issues that we have is that they combined all nine variances into one, and then they justified it as one. And what we would like to see with the waivers is not to just say, well, you got these nine waivers or however many waivers they're asking, and it's unnecessary hardship or whatever. We, we're going to approve all the waivers. We would, we would request that they look at, you look at the waivers separately, and each one is justified separately not as one and that one one's hidden inside another one or whatever so we re respectfully request that if you don't do that already if you, if you would maybe approach it in that way um, um one of the waivers was oh go ahead go ahead uh, I, your suggestion is a reasonable one sometimes our board considers waivers in in aggregate sometimes one at a time um, what the ZBA chose to do or not do is, um, again, something we wouldn't even begin to pass comment on. They're a separate board with their own authority. Um, but uh, knowing that we've got a choice for how we would do it, I don't even know what waivers, if any, the applicant has asked for. Um, but I would support dealing with them one at a time. Actually, there's six waivers listed. So um, I don't have a problem accepting your recommendation to deal with those waivers one at a time. Thank you. Also, they, uh, they list uh, one of the waivers is that utility poles will be closer to the pavement than the standard 
number, whatever that is. Um, is it possible, and maybe you would have already asked this, well, what, what is, how close is close? When it leaves it open, is it just based on what's measured on the map? I can't measure it on the map because one inch equals 50 feet, and that means one foot is one fiftieth of an inch. I can't measure that, and, and the symbol is not the scale. So is it possible to ask, reference each particular, youth, which poles are going to be close, and what, how close is that particular pole going to be to the pavement? Um, that's a reasonable question that I think would automatically be part of the discussion the planning board would have when it got to that waiver. Um, that said, the, those several waivers about utilities are um, codependent. And if allowing utility poles, well, then there's no, wor yeah. no, no longer a worry about where they are, how close they are to something else. Um, so. Roger. Okay, thanks. Also, um, if it's possible, if you can, they mentioned uh, the grade, you know, 15 feet of 9% grade, 8% uh, is the limit. And uh, is it possible to get the total number of feet on Charles Road that where the grade will exceed 8%? And also the total number of feet on the Elizabeth Drive, where the grade will exceed 8%, not just what's below 9%, but what's above 8%. Um, I'll clarify that with the applicant. Um, based on the requirement of our regulations, what they should have given us is any stretches that are above eight, because 8.00 is the requirement. So 8.01 should have been described to us. Okay, thank you. That's I keep hearing what's under 9%. That's why we I asked that question. Thank you very much. Um, I think for this that. meeting... I think for this meeting, that's all I have. Thank you. Excellent. Are there other abutters or interested citizens who wish to weigh in? We see a hand that went up for, it says call in user one. It doesn't have the number, but if you've just raised your hand a second ago, use star six to unmute yourself and then introduce yourself and tell us what you'd like the board to know. Hello, <clears throat> Hello, Mr. Chairman. My name is John Sutter. Uh, I'm at 9 Elizabeth Drive, which is lot 3A17 on your map. Thank you. What's on your mind today? Uh, my, uh, residents of the new section of Charles Road will be close to their neighbors at the north end of Elizabeth Drive, but must walk around to the south end of Elizabeth Drive to visit them. To compensate for Elizabeth Drive not being built as in the original plan, I ask that the planning board require the applicant to include a pedestrian right-of-way as described in Section 4.13E of the subdivision regulations to provide circulation from the end of the Charles Road cul-de-sac to the north end of Elizabeth Drive. All right. Any other comments? Uh, just a comment. Uh, I'm disappointed that my walkthrough of Squires Drive will not be on Merrimack TV. Okay. Any other comments? No, no sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sauter. Uh, are there other abutters or citizens who wish to weigh in? Okay, with that in mind, we'll close the public hearing. And Matt, let me get you to address a few things that were suggested. Um, talk to us about the plan and the argument related to utility poles and uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think, Mr. Chairman, I mean, I've written down two pages of comments here. And, um, you know, this thing started two years ago and, and a name Brent from my office was mentioned, he's no longer yeah, here. Um, you know, the variance applications that have been discussed about here was done by somebody else as well. Uh, there's a lot of good questions from Mr. Peterson here um, that I can definitely take a look at and address, but I think it's better for me to sit down with my client at this point and discuss some of these before I say things that might've been said two years ago wrong, because I would like to clean this up and make this correct in moving forward. Um, I'm the person that's gonna present this all the way through and be done with this. So 
I kind of just feel like at this point, it seems like there was a lot of stuff that might was said at a lot of different meetings. And I've got a lot of stuff here as far as the Squire Drive that I would like to sit down with council uh, to find out if there's a way to make these things move forward in a proper manner. I know that we are not trying to hide, I just don't do that. I'm not trying to hide things and move things in different directions. Um, and I wanna make sure that what I say about Squires Drive and those types of things is accurate. As far as the uh, slopes of the roads and the utilities, again, I, I just looked at the plan and there's a line that goes down Elizabeth Drive that goes to nothing as Mr. Peterson just stated, that just shouldn't be on the plan. I, I'm not really sure why it was on that plan. So. Again, I'd rather take his one at a time with real answers, talk to Eversource, make sure I think what he has said is definitely true to a certain stents, but then at the same sense, Eversource works with us on every project putting stuff in. So I, I just would like to hear from their mouth directly so that I'm not saying something that makes me look like I'm lying or trying to draw the board down a certain direction. I'd rather have the answers correct um, and come back to the board with those. Um, the walking trails, the bike, the circulations, um, you know, the different, the conditions of the appeal from the zoning. I think it would make more sense. Um, again, this is just acceptance tonight. I think with the amount of letters you said they're there, I'd love to read through those and make sure that I answer everything as one big hole and kind of can address everybody's on that. I think it would be better at this point. I, I, I could go into each one on my plan and show you where the utilities are and where we put them. And, you know, there's a lot of ledge out there. So we put them at this location here and there, but I just would rather sit down with the client and with legal counsel and have it as one whole package to you, if that made sense to you, Mr. Chairman. It does. And it's a great suggestion um, that you take it all in. You get a chance to look at the written comments that have come in and, and be able to speak to all of those at once. And um, I do appreciate the desire not to answer off the cuff and then have some sense that, oh, well, that wasn't exactly the way it is once you look into it. So I think that that's fine. Although um, you uh, mentioned something which catches me a little bit flat footed and I have to apologize to the group for it. Um, if we've not accepted this application as complete yet, and I don't think that we have, then <laughs> we're way out of order, it, 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 way out of the, the sequence of uh, things that we should have done with taking testimony. With that in mind, I would like the board to consider whether the application is complete uh, before we go any further with this discussion. Uh, what is the will of the board? Do you require more information on that question or do you feel like you've got enough information? Nelson. Mr. Chairman, I don't think it is complete. Uh, based on what uh, Mr. Peterson just said and, and what we've heard from the abutters here, I think there's a lot of open issues here. I'm not ready to accept it. Accepting it starts the 60 day clock, is that correct? A 65 day clock and then obviously there's opportunities for continuance. Um, if your view is that it's not complete, um, I'd certainly invite uh, a clarification as to what you think the applicant should provide. Because um, I believe I'm complete with the waiver application being submitted, whether or not you give me the utility poll. I, I mean, everything I've submitted meets the requirements and that kind of stuff here. What I'm saying about discussion is at the beginning of the meeting it was talked and again this probably should have been already accepted before bill brought up the you know thing about squire drive and me starting to think about that avenue and some of the things that have come up during the discussion now has changed the application but everything was submitted uh to give you jurisdiction to start the the process thank you matt for that um bill did you have a related comment or were you in a different that, direction that stole my thunder okay um i just the, the only question that I would ask is based on the suggestion that I that I did that I did made we if we accept this plan is complete and Matt incorporates some of the suggestions that have been talked about tonight does 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 that change the the, the, the complexity of our review? based on what's being presented to us tonight. In other words, we're seeing one thing. If we accept it, Matt goes to the drawing board and he could conceivably come back. I mean, not major alterations, but the, 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 the presentation could be, 
could be changed somewhat differently from what we're looking at right now. So I guess, I guess I would be looking for some guidance in that area. Sure. Um, it's fairly common with our subdivision applications that we determine that they're complete and then there's still some changes in configurations and we've seen some where lot numbers, uh, the number of lots have changed. I think that one that was Chestnut Hill over by the middle school was one of those that started out in the 60 something lots and ended up in the 70 something number of lots. Um, and as a result of things that we review or that we ask the applicant to do, lot lines are moved and changed. Um, completeness is not necessarily anything close to determination that the application meets our regulations. It's has the applicant submitted to find that it's, you know, done incorrectly and improperly and we won't approve it, but are all of the check boxes complete? You know, do we have a, well, in this case, a subdivision plan? Um, it doesn't, it doesn't have all the components of a site plan with lighting plan and all those kinds of things. Um, so with that in mind, if we're uh, focused on the question of completeness, um, I just want to make sure if we think that it's incomplete, we're identifying what we want the applicant to give us that would have gotten it over that line. Well, I, guess, um, I have a follow up question, I guess. I guess it would be from Matt. If, if we do accept as complete, Based on the the anecdotes that have been that have been presented tonight, potentially does that make the sixty five day clock problematic in addressing cons those concerns, especially the one that I, you know the one that I, I brought up tonight? Does that make it difficult? From my standpoint, we've already gotten the uh, review comments, and I got some DPW ones on Friday as well. So, I mean, I'm in the process now with I've already got stuff that I needed, so it does not. However, I think this board knows pretty well that if I get to the point of 55 days, I'm not going to not give you an extension. That would just be ridiculous. No, I mean, everybody always gives extensions not because perfect. if you press a board for a vote, you're going to get a no. Uh, so why not, you know, give the extra time, provide the extra information. Yep. So okay. the 65 day clock is not, not a particularly tough constraint for a planning board to manage. Um, are there items, specific items that we think the applicant hasn't provided us that we want to see? Um, the only one that I see based on the staff's memo, and the staff's memo does recommend that we find it complete. Um, the only one that is identified in there is whether the applicant intends to either provide sidewalks or request a waiver therefore. Um, and uh, we don't necessarily need to have a waiver submitted or a plan with sidewalks on it, <clears throat> but the applicant's intention to go in one direction or the other would be useful to know. Other than that, I can't think of information that isn't provided in the applicant's view in terms of how they'd like to develop their product, their property. Um, Matt, would, can you give us would, any insight? Yeah, and I would on? also just like to say, and I'm not trying to be pushy here, but once we opened the public hearing and got comment about my application and got it ripped apart, is where now we're sitting here saying it's not complete. So I just want the board to, you know, usually it's accepted beforehand on that. Um, sitting here today, I'll, I'll ask for a waiver tomorrow on the sidewalk, but I'm listening to a lot of comments and I'm realizing that, you know, we'll see where that goes. But for application acceptance, I would say I'm asking for a waiver on sidewalk because I didn't show it on the plan that's there. Thank you, Matt. And I agree with you. It's my fault that we're out of order on this. I was, I should have been watching the process that we're following. Um, so with that Mr. Chairman, I'll move that the, Mr. Chairman, I would move that the board accept the application as it is substantially complete and contains sufficient information to invoke the board's jurisdiction and to allow the board to make an informed decision. Thank you, Bill. Uh, is there a second for Bill's motion? Nelson Disco has a second for the motion. Um, is there discussion about completeness? Uh, let's do a roll call vote. Alistair, how do you vote? I vote aye, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Boyd. Boyd votes aye. Nelson Disco. Aye. Bob Best votes aye as well. Um, 400 to find the application complete. Okay. Um, that puts the um, thank you, Matt, for indulging us as we straightened that piece of business out. Um, 
it seems like the applicant needs some time to uh, take in all the comments from the uh, abutters and consult with their uh, client um, to see if some of these other things that we've discussed are viable. Um, and it is also the staff's recommendation that we um, now decide to continue the application to a future meeting so that we can address all of those things. Um, I'm glad to take up that question. I just want to make sure that we've identified all of the things that are supposed to happen between today and next time um, before we actually pull the trigger on a vote for when next time will be. Um, Matt, do you have a, uh, enough understanding from your viewpoint as to what we're doing between today and next time? Got two pages full of notes, so yes, I do. Is there any questions that you think you want the applicant to address? Any inclination on open next time? I think it's probably a next time one. I, I think we've gotten through some stuff here today, and let's just uh, let's finalize some stuff now because we had some comments that had to address some stuff too. So I think it's better just to come back with a clean one. Okay, um, Matt, what schedule works for you for when next time will be? I think we're talking the second one in April there. I don't have the date in front of me. But April 20th, according 20th. to Robert Price's memo. And that gives us over a month. That's pretty yeah. good to me. Casey, do you know the submission deadline for the April 20th meeting? Thank you. Uh, typically, we, am I, I forget what happened. Uh, typically, it's three weeks ahead of time that we would like to be able to review plans. Three? Oh, or, or two. Two, yeah, I was going to say yeah, that's <laughs> it's closer to two. Um, okay, so two week uh, submission deadline. Um, I know that we're as a board, um, we've had some plans and some things appear before us at a meeting, we would certainly prefer to have the, uh, the staff have the opportunity to address all of the things that you submit before and comment on them before we do. Um, if you're unable to make that submission deadline, you may end up where we meet and look at your stuff, but we're not going to vote on it because we haven't heard from the staff. So I make totally that agree. deadline. Totally agree with that. Uh, make that deadline. Any other comments by members of the board? If not, is there a motion to continue to April 20th? Mr. Chairman, so move so that the applicant can address the comments received tonight and also to deal with any peer engineering review or other matters as illuminated tonight. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Councillor Boyd, for the motion. Is there a second? Nelson, Nelson I see your hand up. We'll count you as a second. Um, Alistair, how do you vote? I vote aye, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Boyd? Boyd votes aye. Nelson Disco? I vote aye. Bob Best votes aye as well. So, Matt, we'll see you on April 20th. Excellent. Thank you very much for your time tonight, guys. Thank you for the presentation going through the project. Have a good night. Um, you, you too. Uh, we're at item six, which is discussion and possible action regarding other items of concern. Does anyone have any discussion items for tonight? I don't see any hands up. I don't personally have any um, other than the general appeal to anybody who might be watching us on TV. If you're interested in being a part of a board, here's your chance. We've got opportunities. Come on down. You too could be on the planning board. And if you're good at it, we'll make you the chair. <laughs> I don't know about that. We'll see. Um, okay, next item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes of March 2nd, 2021. What's the will of the board? So moved as presented. Is there a second? Allison uh, seconds. Mr. Chairman. Ballister seconds. Um, okay, any comments or edits to the minutes of March 2nd? No. Nope. We're hanging on, Nelson, or you say no? No, I said no. I'm sorry. Okay, good. Uh, all right, then let's do a roll call vote. Alistair, how do you vote? I vote on, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Bill Boyd. Boyd votes aye. Nelson Disco. Aye. Bob Best votes aye as well. Uh, that's 400 to approve the minutes of March 2nd. There are no other items on our agenda for business tonight. And so, with that in mind, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Is there a second? Can't get a second on a motion to adjourn. I'm sorry. There it is. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. I will second that. There we go. All right. Alistair, vote. I say aye, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Boyd. Boyd votes aye. 
Nelson Disco. Aye. Bob Best votes aye as well. 400 to adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everyone, for the work. Thank you to all the applicants and the abutters who are weighing in, providing the board information. Um, and uh, we'll see you all in a few weeks. Thanks so much. Merrimack TV is committed to our community. From gavel to gavel coverage of town and school board meetings to updates on town services and projects, we aim to keep you connected. Uh, good morning, I'm Kyle Fox, Public Works Director for the Town of Merrimack. Hi, I'm Diane Trippett. I'm the Town Clerk Tax Collector for the Town of Merrimack. I'm Captain Matt Tarleton with the Merrimack New Hampshire Police Department. And keep the public informed of every motion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And many moments, so you can be confident that we're here for you. Thanks for watching. Stay connected. Follow Merrimack TV on Facebook.